fascinating trend in recent entertainment is that the villains are often as, if not more, popular and interesting than the heroes they are put up against. Now, this is not a uniquely modern thing by any stretch of the imagination, of course. We all know and love old villains like Darth Vader or the Joker, or perhaps the best example of them all, the T-800 Terminator, whose betrayal by good old Arnold Schwarzenegger made it into an iconic character with an entire series of movies. But these aforementioned examples were exceptions, remarkable outliers in a time and medium where the villain's primary purpose was of course to make the heroes look good, to give them a challenge to overcome, a great evil to defeat, and fears to vanquish. To put it quite plainly, the villain was who we were supposed to be rooting against, as we cheered on the hero in shining armour. And yet recently I find more and more frequently that this is not the case with Adam from the hit show Has Been Hotel being a brilliant example of a deceptively deep and interesting character that came about almost as a writing accident, a character whose actions are, if not perfectly justifiable, then certainly absolutely understandable, indeed even sympathetic, and his friendship with Loot becomes all the deeper when you understand why. But first. To properly lay out my thinking here, I need to start with another example entirely. That might seem like a completely unrelated sidetrack, but stick with me here. There is a method to my madness as I whisk you away to a galaxy far, far away. Where I had my first truly conscious realization that modern writing accidentally creates better villains than it does heroes and that this is practically unavoidable with the television series Ahsoka, where we witness a lightsaber duel between the titular main character and Balan Skull, an ex-Jedi Knight now pursuing his own goals as a mercenary, and the entire scene is so jarringly… off that it's almost difficult to describe. Let's start with the most disconnected part of it all, the simple, plain as a beef patty with bread fact that Ahsoka is in no danger in this scene whatsoever. As I am watching this fight, I am completely and utterly sure that Ahsoka cannot be killed. She cannot be severely wounded or crippled or even merely inconvenienced for any real length of time, nor is her quest in any danger either. Even if she fails to recover the MacGuffin of the hour, then some other MacGuffin, or in this case space whales, literally, will emerge to let her continue her quest. I know this because she is literally the titular main character in a modern Star Wars show one in which her sidekick just an episode or two ago took a lightsaber to the gut, a wound that would and has been in the past instantaneously lethal, and seeing as it would indeed flash boil half her intestines, yes, it should be lethal, and yet she walked it off in a single episode. This is a show in which Ahsoka's ship is impervious to enemy fire. We see repeated weapons impact splash harmlessly across its hull, not leaving so much as a scorch mark behind. And so in this fight, Ahsoka might as well be Superman fighting a bank robber for all my sense of danger cares. And this would be bad enough in isolation, but there is the visuals of the fight as well. Balan's skull, played by the now tragically departed Ray Stevenson, is a titan of a man. At 191 centimeters, he towers over Ahsoka. He's got biceps bigger than her thighs, and at one point even tosses Ahsoka through the air single-handed. With every baseball-like swing of his lightsaber, you half expect him to launch Ahsoka home run style into the sky. And the choreography only makes it worse, as you can constantly see him do his move, then pause, wait for Ahsoka to catch up and hit his lightsaber so he can do his next move. He moves with painfully obvious and ponderous slowness, like a fencing teacher sparring with a particularly ungifted student. Even the fact the scene is shot in the middle of the night cannot hide the blatant disparity, and it grinds to dust any remaining suspension of disbelief in the story and Ahsoka's invulnerability. And indeed, 
she even loses the duel because we're at the point of the story where the scriptwriter's manual says the hero must be presented with adversity without really understanding what adversity means. But despite sending her flying off a cliff and into the raging oceans, there is never any doubt as to Ahsoka's safety, as she is found hale and hearty in the next episode, after a little dream sequence where she restores her faith in herself, oh, and defeats Anakin Skywalker in a dream duel, of course. As predictable and undesirable as an anal fissure after sitting on a cast iron cactus. And all of this is due to a failure to produce the illusion of risk. Because, of course, the main character being impervious to death is also nothing new. In fact, it is standard, as standard as standard can be. Because, well, if you kill the main character, the driving force of the story, your story more often than not falls apart. Duh. Luke Skywalker did not die in Star Wars. Darth Vader did. Paul Atreides did not die in Dune. Raban did. Aragorn did not die in The Lord of the Rings. Sauron did. But... I then also hasten to add that Obi-Wan Kenobi did die, Duke Leto Atreides did die, and Boromir of Gondor did die. They're not the main characters to be sure, but they are heroes, often avatars of virtue, be it wisdom for Kenobi, integrity for Leto, and strength for Boromir. And seeing these heroic characters fall to the slings and arrows of the enemy adds a delicious thrill of a danger to the story. It adds stakes. If these, the best of men, can die, then our heroes are not invulnerable. They can be broken, and they can die. And finally, knowing all of this, I also realized that whilst watching the fight, I was still worried about one of the characters. I was worried about Balon. It was the only character that could be injured or killed, and his quest could fail. In fact, it was practically guaranteed to fail. And as for taking casualties, whilst the loss counter on the good dude side of things would stay resolutely at zero throughout the entire show, Balan's side would be cut down in heaps. If it truly is human nature to root for the underdog, and I believe it probably is, then Balon and his crew are a duck's hund, currently suffering from severe cranial trauma, three out of four legs amputated, its tail bitten off, and its body currently pinned beneath the bulk of a grand piano, compared to the Russian bear hound that is Ahsoka. Furthermore, Balan's ideas are just way more interesting. He saw the fall of the Old Order. He survived the purges and he sees the disorder of the current galaxy. He now strives to fix it by his own means. He knows the Jedi Order was a grand dream, but an ephemeral one. He understands that principle must be backed up by force. That is why he's seeking out the remnants of this long lost empire, for power, not for its own sake, but for the galaxies. That is interesting. And there's also something modern writers simply cannot understand. Here, there is a fascinating excerpt from an interview from Dave Filoni talking about Ray Stevenson. Quote, But I am glad the conversation is about Ray and how great he was. I used to have many debates with him and say, Ray, you're the villain here. And he'd be like, I don't think so. I was like, I know you didn't think so, but you are. I love that you're playing it like you're not, which is exactly the way Balin thinks. End quote. All Dave Filoni sees is a big dude in a black cape with a darkish colored lightsaber. The bad dude, the villain. But Ray Stevenson, having taken on the character, knows this is not true. Balin Skull is only a villain insofar as he is in opposition to the hero, Ahsoka. A hero who has no answers for herself, whose republic is failing, and whose only true current gift is plot armor so thick you could bounce a space whale off it. And herein lies the clue as to why this is all the case. The absence of care for the character of Balin may have inadvertently created a better character by getting the writer out of the way. And this is where we turn to Hasbin Hotel with Loot and Adam, two villainous characters that in so many ways supersede the heroes. And credit where credit is due, unlike with Filoni and Balon, I do believe these two were far more intentionally intriguing. As for all the flaws of Hasbin Hotel, it's quite clearly a labour of love for its creator. So, the idea then of getting the writer out of the way. 
In the case of Ahsoka, the writer was obviously focused dead exclusively on Ahsoka. She was the hero and the focal point of practically everything, and saw the world warps around her. And the closer you are to this warp, the worse off you are. Thrawn, for example. He is supposed to be the single most luminescent military genius in all of the Star Wars galaxy, and yet in Ahsoka he is presented as an incompetent middle management officer that again and again sends his extremely limited manpower resources into the blender that is Ahsoka for absolutely no gain. So why does it happen? Well, it's because Thrawn the Genius is transformed into Thrawn the Blueberry Retard by proximity to Ahsoka. He stops being his own character and becomes a foil for her. Meanwhile, Balin, protected by his status as a secondary villain, little more than a big thug with a dialogue, is allowed to become the most interesting character by virtue of excellent casting, race performance, and not being Ahsoka's principal opponent. And Adam and Loot are perhaps an even better example of this, albeit again more intentionally. See, has been Hotel, despite all of its plot holes, oh, more correctly, uh, being made up purely of plot holes, certainly has a cast of charming characters, but most if not all of them are two-dimensional, straight up, and fit strangely into the world as a whole. Uh, Charlie, for example, a kind and caring and incredibly trusting and optimistic Princess of Hell. You can see the disconnect. And that is, of course, a deliberate part of the charm, but still, it does mean that Really, the whole hell thing is little more than an aesthetic choice, allowing for a wide variety of horned and furry characters to be created. And then, into this world of largely style before substance, steps Adam and Loot. And for once, they are exactly what they look like, without the writer worrying about whether the audience likes them or sympathizes with them, yari yari, the characters are allowed to simply be. And it makes them interesting and complex too. Look at Adam. He is brash, rude, and absolutely resplendent with self-confidence. And why shouldn't he be? He is God's own personal creation, the first man, the unironic Alpha and the Omega, the Dickmeister, as he would put it. He is a lovable asshole and an all-around cool dude that seems like a ton of fun to hang out with. But let's look a little bit deeper because this is not all there is to him. Part of his bluster, a very large part, is a defense mechanism, you see. When he is eventually defeated, he goes on a rant about how the demons should be grateful to him, about how he made them, and at the time, I admit I felt it was little more than a way to humiliate the character yet further, to have him throw a pathetic fit about being beaten. But in retrospect, it makes sense. Adam's confidence is his shield a self-preservation mechanism. He needs to hype himself up because he lost everything. Twice! Remember Lilith, the, the first woman created for Adam to be his partner? Literally, by God! She betrayed him, cucked him even, for Lucifer. That's a kick in the shins for any man right there, but for Adam, it was just the start. God, realizing that he needed a man and a woman to make humanity, crafted another, a second female for Adam, and this time, to make doubly sure, he made her from Adam's own flesh and bone. Eve would surely be everything that Lilith failed to be. Well, um... About that, if there are any Bible history students out there watching this, I am sure you know where this is going. And yes, indeed, Adam was cucked again by the same damn angel, Lucifer. And this time he didn't just steal Adam's girl, he full-on hentai mind broke her, transforming her Eve into a portal for all human evil by eating the apple, and getting both herself and Adam tossed out of the Garden of Eden. Yeah, um, Adam's a douche and all, don't get me wrong, but maybe he has his reasons? To further add to this, consider Adam and Lou together. Their relationship is the best one in the show, period. 
Think about it. Adam had two wives before Lilith and Eve, both of which were made for him, and one of which was his literal flesh, and yet both of them betrayed him. With the same dude, I might add. And along comes Loot. Now, tragically, we don't know much about their past history, but the two match one another perfectly. They are always together, practically finish one another's sentences, and back one another up flawlessly in their songs. Better still, they don't just back one another up, they even hold one another back when needed. Loot wanted to launch a second round of exterminations immediately after the angel's corpse was found. Adam told her to wait, knowing that to do so, to launch another extermination immediately, would risk discovery in heaven and provoke the demons, which had just demonstrated an ability to kill them, and so rushing off half cocked would probably be quite risque, to put it mildly. And vice versa, when Adam is about to go off on Charlie in heaven, Loot stops him, knowing that starting a fight on the promenade is a terrible idea. Again, we don't know anything about that history, but personally I would imagine that when Adam came to heaven, he would have been a very different man. One who had been betrayed again and again. One who had been thrown out of paradise and made to live in the harsh wilderness. And if Cain and Abel exists in the hotel universe, whew. well, um, I think it's pretty safe to say that Adam's human life was probably pretty goddamn awful. And then he dies and goes to heaven, where he meets Loot. And one final time, this is purely by speculation here, but a man who's lived a life like Adam's is probably not going to be very cocksure about himself. I would wager he was a complete wreck when he came to heaven, and clearly something changed in the millennia between then and now, and I believe that change was loot. The one woman, or hell, the one person in his life that never betrayed him, even until the very end. I like to think that was what that final smile was all about, that he had a friend by his side when he died for a second time. But let's not get too sentimental, for a sob story alone does not a character make. And Adam was also an ass, using plenty of foul language and acting like an absolute douchebag. Bearing in mind that, well, men do act like douchebags towards people they like. In fact, if anything, it's a sign of closeness rather than enmity, really. And what about his exterminations in hell? That's the most salient point, right? What about all the, as Emily put it, innocent souls he killed? Well, that's where things get a little bit spicy. See, Adam was the one who argued for the exterminations to begin with, and convinced Sarah of the necessity. Lucifer, too, agreed to not intervene so long as only sinners were targeted, e.g. no hellborn demons like his daughter were to be harmed. That'll be important later. But why launch the exterminations? Well, the stated reason was because Lilith was making hell grow out of control, and seeing as we can literally see heaven from hell, it stands to reason that Heaven might get a little worried about the ever-increasing number of monsters marching in lockstep to the tune of the oldest demon in existence. Since, you know, Lucifer's technically a fallen angel and all that. And considering that the Densians of Hell are, well, the worst souls from Earth, and that they have already turned Hell into... Uh, hell? It is pretty reasonable to assume them to be more than a little violent, and everything we've seen from Hell, with the exception of Charlie and like five other people, reinforces that assumption. The V's wanted to do and had even planned out an attack on Heaven's garrison in Hell in the show, but they were, you know, rude about it, so Carmilla decided to not tell them about the stacks of angel weapons she had saved up. Somehow. Camilla also thought that if Hell realized there was a way to fight back, then an uprising was inevitable. By this logic, then, the angels are correct. Adam is correct. They fear an uprising, and this uprising is only kept in check by what is perceived to be an absolute power imbalance. There can be no challenge to Heaven's might, as the slightest crack might spell doom for both sides, mind you. The demons fear the angels will exterminate them if the demons start to fight back. And the angels fear the demons because, well, they are demons! Led by overlords who deal in millions of souls. These are not nice people. 
Demonstrably, they aren't. This all seems like a pretty good reason for the exterminations right there. And we could also sprinkle in a little personal desire as well. Adam does, after all, state that the exterminations is entertainment. But I think this has less to do with simple sadism and more to do with the fact that hell is the personal kingdom of Lucifer, the dude who cucked Adam. Mm, twice. Do you blame Adam for holding a crutch? <laughs> sure, he's held on to it for a while now, but still, hell is forever. And I also want to point out here that Adam is actually less gung-ho about the exterminations than Lutus. Now there's classic girlfriend symptom right there, where the girlfriend will take significantly more offense at any wrongdoings towards the boyfriend than the boyfriend will. Okay, just pointing it out. And that is another good reason as well. The angels are angels. They have, as far as they know and as far as their doctrine says, proven themselves to be good people. And the demons have proven themselves to be bad people. Why then should angels, good people, be forced to view the demons, bad people, like moral actors at all? They already chose evil, as a man only lives once. Adam's position on all this is 100% consistent, understandable, and in character, and in universe. But then there is the question of redemption, and why Adam would be so hard set against Charlie and her hotel. Well, one way of viewing it is like this. Adam is a border control officer, one that looks down at hell, where the crime rate is universal, and most of it is either violent, sexual, or tied to drugs that make 20 pounds of heroin seem like a fucking aspirin. It's a pretty petite wonder indeed that he has grown somewhat strident in his enforcement efforts over the years, and a smaller wonder still that he has seen no reason to believe that the redemption is even possible. And even if it was, would you want the hordes of hell wandering into your living room because some hotel owner said so? <laughs> Adam and Lute have every reason to be antagonistic towards Charlie and her hotel. And finally, what makes their relationship extra special is also that Adam and Lute are faced with genuine adversity. Mostly, admittedly, because of the dumb. So, let's get into it. What doesn't make sense, however, is how antagonistic he gets. Declaring after the court in heaven rules against Charlie, finding that there is no evidence redemption is real, and says then straight to Charlie that he is bringing the extermination to her hotel first. This is the moment when Adam turns from Bale and Skull and into Admiral Thrawn. See, I told you there was a method to my madness. As preceding this, Adam was a side villain. The extermination was the real threat, and Adam and Loot were just ancillary attachments to it. As far as the plot revolving around Charlie, this shows Ahsoka, was concerned. But now that Charlie has failed to convince Heaven of Redemption, and has made no real progress towards it on her own, we need a foil to drive the plot forward. Because if the exterminations happen as usual, with Adam Loot killing another slice of hell, then nothing would change. Charlie would still be there at her hotel, Serpentius would not have been resurrected, and Charlie would not have been desperate enough to strike a deal with Alistair. The forward momentum of the plot depends on Adam turning into a mouth-breathing, blabbering retard. And so he does. Bearing in mind again, Adam was the one who pushed for the exterminations. He is its overseer and main leader. He was even probably a co-signature on the treaty that stated clearly that no hellborn demons could be touched. A deal made with Lucifer Morningstar. And Adam is now planning to attack Charlie Morningstar, his direct family. There is no universe in which Adam, no matter how confident or brazen, would forget this fact. Especially as he also knows he can't fight Lucifer. Adam is merely an angel, if even that as a you know, resident of heaven. 
he is at the bottom of the heavenly hierarchy, and his powers primarily, presumably, stems from his age. Meanwhile, Lucifer was an archangel, at least and in some interpretations of the Bible, a seraphim. There is no way Adam, who has been in heaven for millennia, is unaware of what that means. Even if Lucifer was just an archangel, that puts him above Adam. And if he was a seraphim, then he would have been one of the highest angels in heaven. And as we also know that demons and angels apparently grow more powerful with age, as seen with the Overlord and Adam, and Lucifer and Adam indeed, there should be no way Adam would be willing to take on Lucifer. And even if he, he would, loot would not have let him. Even if we assume that Adam had somehow spaced all of this, loot sure as hell wouldn't. She's an actual angel. I mean, hell, a <laughs> fight on the promenade is, oh, oh no, don't do that. But assaulting Satan's baby girl? That's, that's, that's not a problem. This is very obviously very dumb and can only be explained by looking at Balin and Thrawn. The baleful gaze of the plot and the writer's necessity to move the plot around now rests on Adam as it did Thrawn. And if it can reduce the finest military mind in the galaxy to an invalid corpse pusher, then Adam never stood much of a chance, did he? And there is another reason to love Adam and loot. They are the underdogs. They are the only ones to suffer loss. Adam dies, leaving Loot, his trusted lieutenant, alone. Heaven's power over Hell is shattered, and this in turn sees the far more aggressive V's start plotting to take charge. And with it being proven to everyone now that angels can die, the demon uprising is all but inevitable. You know, unless the writer's pen gets involved, of course. But the point remains, the only one who died, the only one who lost and were hurt in the final fight, were the angels. Loot loses an arm, Adam loses his life, and heaven its power over hell. The heroes lose nothing, not a single thing. The hotel is rebuilt in five minutes with magic. Sir Pentius, their sole casualty besides nameless redshirt cannibal goons, is resurrected in heaven. And even the damn pet thing lives. And I don't know about you, but... I have a very hard time caring about the trials and tribulations of characters I know can't be hurt. Whose quests can not fail. To the point where even the vilest villain, so long as he has a story and stakes in the plot, seems infinitely preferable. And to finally hammer home that point beyond any doubt, a bonus round. John Smith. Or to give him his full title, Obergruppenführer John Smith of the Waffen SS America branch. Yeah. He is a character from The Man in the High Castle, a story about an alternative timeline where Nazi Germany and Japan won the war and occupied the US. Smith is a defector from the US Army and a member of the International Socialist Party. He is a literal black greatcoat wearing SS armband Nazi. Barring child-eating aliens, that is just about the most villainous backstory in fiction. And yet, he is infinitely more interesting than the heroes of the story. They are just rebels, freedom fighters, fighting for love and puppies and other amorphous, not very well-defined things. They are defined by their opposition to the Reich and to Smith. Two-dimensional upstarts whom we all know will triumph no matter the odds. Oh, you need to take on the entire world, do you? The victorious Nazi war machine? Oh, well, I wonder how you'll do it. Easily, of course. Whilst Smith, oh, he is a father, a husband, a party man to the bone, but also a revolutionary, an insurrectionist, a rebel and a free thinker. He is a loyalist and a traitor, a soldier and an administrator, a white picket fence, honest man and a plotter. 
and most of all he possesses the gravitic field warping mega balls of tungsten required to infiltrate the heart of the Reich, its command structure and leadership, to play chicken with Himmler and Hitler and win. And he does it all whilst the viewer knows that this man, this villain, is not invulnerable. He is the Stahlhelm wearing guy that dies in every movie. And here he is writing a mad plot by the skin of his teeth. That is entertainment. When you genuinely do not know if the character will still be alive in another second, or another minute, or another hour. And of course, in the end, John Smith dies. Whilst the heroes ride off into the sunset, uninteresting and ignored. Modern entertainment has unironically made me more interested in the survival and the adventures of a literal Nazi than the American freedom fighters that oppose him. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about modern storytelling from that, but I think it's getting pretty obvious what the problem is. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.